Have angels visited us? What's the evidence? Well, I want to share with you some remarkable accounts of people who say they have actually seen angels or felt their invisible presence or their, the angels' guidance and help in their lives. And I want to read some accounts uh, from this uh, marvellous book, Encountering Mystery, by Professor Dale Allison. He's a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary in the United States. I had the, uh, the privilege of interviewing him uh, just recently on Blogging Theology, and you can see uh, the full interview in the link in the description below. But in this book, he has lots of uh, accounts, first-person accounts of people, uh, people's experience of angels, and I just want to share them with you. And then at the end, I just want to uh, explore a little bit um, about the Islamic understanding of uh, angels. What do Muslims believe about the, the nature and role of angels in a human being's life? And I'll come to that at the end. So on page 77 uh, in this book, um, Dale Allison writes, According to Catherine C. Calor of Otherley, Kansas, when she and her sister, Carol, were about eight and six respectively, the two learned to climb a large tree in their front yard. One day, with Catherine above her, Carol slipped off a branch. Yet she did not, her sister claims, fall and hit the ground as expected. She rather, quote, floated like a piece of paper back and forth until she landed on the ground far below on her feet, end quote. She was unhurt. The explanation for this fortunate outcome? An angel, Catherine inferred, must have intervened. Another illustration of an alleged slow fall concerns a woman named Janny and her five-year-old daughter. Soon after moving into their new house, the little girl, wearing a Superman costume, climbed up the 14-foot scaffold inside the still unfinished circular staircase in the middle of the entrance hall. In her imagination, she was being brave. But when she looked down, she discovered how high up she was. Becoming frightened, she lost her balance. She then slipped, screamed, Mummy, help! And she fell from the scaffold. Janney was too far away to do anything but watch, can you imagine? Yet, as she looked on, it was as if an invisible arm stretched out beneath her daughter and gently laid her down on the floor. When the medics arrived, they found, to their amazement, neither bruise nor broken bone. The girl was no worse for her fall. If some uh, narratives recount a slow fall from above, others feature invisible hands that help here below. One cold spring morning when Mrs. Jean Blitz of Whittaker in Kansas was several months pregnant with her fifth child, she stepped onto her front porch to see whether or not the milkman had yet made the day's delivery. Too late, she realised that ice had glazed the concrete, that the footing was hazardous. Her feet did not hold. As her hand had no handrail to latch onto, it seemed certain she would hit the concrete hard. No little matter given her gravid condition. She was pregnant. As her posterior approached the pavement, however, time seemed to slow down and two strong arms not only caught Jean, but stood her up against the door. Thinking that her husband had fortuitously happened by at a life-saving moment, she turned to speak her relief and gratitude to him. Instead of her husband, who, had con who later confirmed his lack of participation, she saw only an empty doorway. There was no one there at all. Her inference was immediate. Some formless and invisible force had first slowed Jean's fall, then straightened her up, then set her safely off the ice. An angel. 
And then um, Dale Allison, his book, uh, who's a Christian, um, quotes uh, Psalm 91 verses 11 to 12 uh, to perhaps give a scriptural uh, context to this, which says uh, Psalm 91, 11 to 12, which popular books about angels incessantly cite, has this. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Unquote. Uh, it's an extraordinary quote from uh, the Jewish Bible. So moving on, um, I just want to share some more quotes, uh, different, uh, different um, perhaps experiences of angels' assistance or their presence. And there's one here on page 80. It concerns a three-year-old, Dali of Ignace of Bethpage in New York. All these accounts are in the United States. The author's American. It's all quite specific to that area of the world. One morning, Dale writes, the little boy was recklessly running full tilt across the living room rug when he tripped and fell headfast toward the sharp corner of a table. Ugh. But as his horrified mother looked on, she must have been terrified, the child's forward fall was suddenly and inexplicably halted. Somehow he was stood up and moved over to continue on his happy, oblivious way. Now, it's the sequel to this story that gives it its punch and sets it in the long-term memory, writes Dell Allison. The next day, we are told, Danny, while at play, suddenly looked up and addressed his mother. Mummy, I saw a beautiful lady with wings. The mother, supposing her son to be recounting fantasy, replied, really, Danny, what is the lady like? There followed this, quote, she's nice. She caught me yesterday, so I did not hit my, ta my head against the table. She said she was going to watch over me and keep me from getting hurt. End quote. Remarkable story. And another story um, is found, uh, quoted by uh, Alison, uh, in a book called Hope MacDonald's When Angels Appear. When MacDonald's sister, Marilyn, was eight years old, she made the near fatal mistake of running in front of a car. How many kids have we seen do just this? As her parents and others watched helplessly, she was hit and thrown very high into the air. Upon falling hard to the pavement, the little girl rapidly rolled toward a large open sewer. But to the amazement and relief of the onlookers. Her progress was instantly and inexplicably halted right at the edge of the sewer. Later on, in the presence of her family and doctor, Marilyn, surprised at everyone else's bafflement, offered the explanation. Quote, but didn't you see that huge, beautiful angel standing in the sewer holding up her hands and keeping me from rolling in, end quote. Now, uh, Professor Dale Allison from Princeton uh, writes on page 85 of a chapter called The Law of Angels, which I've been quoting from, and there are many other accounts I've not. And I'm just cherry picking here some nice examples. And I say I'll come in a second to the Islamic understanding of angels, which I think throws some particularly insightful sort of perspective on this whole thing. He writes, angels are not always disguised or entertained unawares. They may also appear as luminous beings of light. Indeed, our contemporaries see angels often enough, or at least beings they call by that name. The numerous books on angels, as well as other sources, document sighting after sighting. So it's a veritable cottage industry in America. You know, countless books on angels uh, have been published and they're read by huge numbers of the public. Here are four illustrations he gives us. A very tall glowing figure was next to his bed, uh, the writer's dying father, all the afternoon and evening. As I held his hand, I became aware of a 10-foot presence kneeling on the opposite side of the bed, 
looking intently into my father's face. The figure was tall, dressed in brilliant white flowing robes and glowing with a sparkling force which was eminently powerful. End quote. Another, another one. In 1959, my father died suddenly. I was bereft, heartbroken. Suddenly, in bed one morning, about the time I'd wake, I looked in the corner of the bedroom, and there was a being such as I have never seen. It was pure gold. I looked at the face, so loving, and all about the head, the most beautiful golden curls and wings that were like overlapping fronds. It seemed a tall being. I could see the flowers on the bedroom wall through its being. It faded. At the time, I felt awe. Uh, I, I later thought such as the shepherds would have felt in the fields. This is a reference to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. As the being faded, I felt happy, so happy and joyous. End quote. And another one, another account. From behind us, we heard the murmur of muted voices in the distance. And I suddenly said to my sister, Marion, we have company in the woods this morning. Marion nodded and, took, and turned to look. We saw nothing, but the voices were coming nearer. Then we perceived that the sounds were not only behind us, but above us, and we looked up. How can I describe what we felt? Is it possible to tell of the surge of exaltation that ran through us? Is it possible to recall this phenomenon in objective accuracy and yet be credible? For about 10 feet above us and slightly to our left was a floating group of glorious creatures that glowed with spiritual beauty. There were six of them young, beautiful women dressed in flowing white garments and uh, engaged in earnest conversation. If they were aware of our existence, they gave, gave no indication of it. Neither Maria nor I could understand their words. It would be, a, would be an understatement to say we were astounded, end quote. What's interesting here, by the way, is that the other accounts have been perhaps of one person having an experience of an angel. Here we have two people who are having a combined vision or uh, experience encounter with angels. It's not just one subjective vision. There's two people having the same encounter, uh, both visual and auditory. So that's very interesting as well. And Della Allison said, I could go on at length with similar accounts. They are legion. In other words, they're numerous. There's tons of them. A 2005 survey of Canadians found an, ast an astonishing 5.8 of those polled reported seeing an angel. This is obviously in Canada. So going on. So there's another um, account here, uh, which I just wanted to uh, uh, share with you. Perhaps he invites us to consider these words, says Alison. As she, uh, a young mother, looked out the kitchen window into the backyard, she noticed that the garden gate had been left open. Her little three-year-old daughter, Lisa, had toddled through the gate and was sitting casually on the railroad tracks playing with the gravel. Can you imagine the alarm? The mother's heart stopped when she, when she saw a train coming round the bend and heard it whistle, blaring persistently. As she raced from the house, screaming her daughter's name, she suddenly saw a striking figure clothed in pure white, lifting Lisa off the tracks. While the train roared past, this glorious being stood by the track with an arm around the child. Together, they watched the train go by. When the mother reached her daughter's side, Lisa was standing alone." Unquote. And then um, Alison says, as with most of the stories in this book, I offer no judgment as to what really happened. Were it true, that would be lovely. Alas, I see no way, given my distance from the events and its principles, to adjudicate the matter. What I can say is this. 
if I were to see a glorious being rescue my daughter from an oncoming train, I would not posit that I had projected an angelic mirage and in addition, somehow managed to psychokinetically to lift my child to safety. I would rather infer, using my Christian language, he says, that an angel had saved her. Would this not be the sensible thing to do? Well, that's a, a very good point. And just to conclude uh, my reading uh, from this, Encountering Mystery by Professor Dale Allison, um, he, he speaks of how some of his uh, colleagues uh, have responded to his interest in this subject and writing this book. On page 97, he says, some of my colleagues, and these are his academic colleagues at university, at Princeton of all places, one of the Ivy League universities in America. Some of my colleagues are perplexed that I read and ponder popular books on angels. Is it not a waste of time for an educated mind to bother with tales told by the gullible? But I pay attention to these books for the same reason my colleagues pay attention to the daily news. They want to know what is going on in our world. A survey a few years back found 54% of Americans reporting they had been, quote, protected from harm by a guardian angel. Wow, that's over half of the population of America report they had been protected by, from harm by a guardian angel. I mean, this is how commonplace these experiences are. They're not just a few mystics, a few esoteric spiritualists. This is like most of the population in the United States. Extraordinary. The number is astonishing, says Dale Allison. Now, finally, I just want to, as promised, I want to come to uh, briefly uh, the Muslim perspective on angels because it's slightly more rounded uh, and very, very interesting indeed. And I'm just going to read a few words from this beautifully produced book. It's a stunningly beautiful book. Uh, Angels in Your Presence by Omar Suleiman, another American, of course, very well known. I'm sure he doesn't need any introduction. And in the first chapter, briefly, uh, entitled, They've Got Your Back. That's a good indication of what we're going to be talking about. He writes this very helpfully. You see videos of incidents online in which a person is walking on the street, unaware of the cars that are coming towards him and a huge truck which is about to collide into him. Suddenly, it's as if an arm just pulls that truck away and it goes on in a completely different direction and that person is unharmed. On the other hand, you see someone who is involved in a freak accident. For instance, a person who is jogging on the beach is suddenly hit by a vehicle or something moving and it is like witnessing a divine decree in precision. I like that, it's like witnessing a divine decree in precision. You are witnessing that perfect kada of Allah, glorified and exalted is he. Now relate that to your own self, uh, Omar Suleiman writes. You're driving on the highway and you are saved from a car accident. You're doing something that distracts you. And in that moment of distraction, something horrible is about to happen. And then you see what happened around you and you say, SubhanAllah, Allah protected me. Another example are those uh, that have seen their children fall, knowing that if they had fallen slightly differently, they would have hit the back of their head and it would have been a catastrophe. All these things that uh, we have witnessed in our lives speak to the overpowering, uh, the overwhelming power of Allah, glorified and exalted is he. But they have something to do with the angels as well. Allah, glorified and exalted is he, says that every single person has a guardian angel behind him and in front of him that protects him by the decree of Allah. That concept requires a lot of reflection. First and foremost, it is a testament to the mercy of Allah. We are, we are always so paranoid about the devils, the shaitan and the jinn being everywhere. But each of us has only one shaitan and four angels assigned to them. 
Everything else that is invited into one's life of angels or devils is invited as a result of one's good or bad deeds. But every single person has, proportionately speaking, four angels that are with them and just one angel that whispers and tempts. Of the four angels, two of them protect you and the other two angels record your deeds. But what do these guardian angels do? What role do they play in your life? They are always with you. They're with you during the day and they're with you when you sleep at night. Uh, they are with you uh, for the most significant and insignificant moments of divine decree within your life. Mujtahid said that your guardian angels protect you from any wild animal, from any riding animal, from any beast or person that wants to harm you, or, and even from, quote, an ant in your ear. If the decree is not upon you to be harmed, the angel, if the decree is not upon you to be harmed, the angels will shoo away those bugs and push away those harmful objects that are coming your way in order to protect you. But what happens to those who are not protected? This is the key Islamic insight, I think. Ali ibn Abi Talib, Allah's mercy be upon him, said, that when he was told that the tribe uh, of Murad were planning to attack him, he replied, they cannot harm me with anything unless Allah, glorified and exalted be he, has decreed it. For Allah has set up guardian angels for each person. And the only time a person is, person is harmed is when those angels are told to stand down. It's a great expression. Angels are told to stand down. That's when Ibn Ibas said, out of obedience to Allah, those angels will protect you and will be there for you and they will only move out of the way when Allah decrees otherwise, end quote. This is a powerful concept on an individual level because it reminds us about the story of the prophet, upon whom be peace, who was protected from his enemies by Jabriel or the hundreds of angels that were sent down to protect the Muslims in the Battle of Badr. Finally, um, Omar Suleiman writes, during the battle, Muslims could even see their enemies were being thrown off their horses and could hear the sound of the whip cracking on someone, but they could not see who was doing it. There is also the example of the prophet's warning about the end of times, when the Jalal will, will try to enter Medina and find angels guarding its gates from all directions. Ibn Ibbas's statement applies to us all. Each of us is protected by these angels that are in front of us and behind us. And the only time they step aside is when Allah, glorified and exalted is he, decrees that harm is coming to us and that harm is what is assigned to us in the womb, a decree also written by an angel. When the decree of death comes our way, the angels will move aside only for our soul to be transferred to another group of angels with the shroud of either paradise or hellfire. End quote. And that's from this book, Angels in Your Presence by Omar Sinema, a very beautifully written and uh, produced little volume. And I, I really like the Islamic perspective because it's not just the fact that angels do assist young children and adults and guide and so on and protect is absolutely true. But in the decree of Allah, when the time comes, the angels are told to stand down and to move aside because that is the, the will and the wisdom of God himself. And often other religions, Christianity, for example, don't quite grasp that point. They think, well, uh, God must always protect us because you know, he loves us and he sends angels to protect us. Yes, he does love us and he does send angels to protect us, but there is the divine decree. And one day uh, the angels will come and they will take us uh, away from our physical bodies into the afterlife. And, and that's often missing, for, I think, from some 
uh, from other religions accounts. But anyway, um, I think that's a fascinating uh, series of accounts and people, first person accounts. And uh, judging by the evidence, there are probably literally millions of stories. I mean, 52% of America, that's what, 350 million people. We're dealing with hundreds of millions of people who could give a similar story. What an extraordinary world we live in. God is very active uh, through his angels uh, to protect us and guide us uh, as Islam bears witness as well. And inshallah, in other, in other interviews, I will look at a very different experience. Do demons, shaitan, visit us? What's the evidence about that? What are people saying about demonic experiences in their lives? And that's a very diabolically disturbing set of accounts. They're very real, uh, very well documented now. Lots has been written about them. And Islam obviously has some profound things to say about uh, uh, the malevolent jinn, the shaitan, the demons uh, in this world. We can't necessarily see them, but they're, they are active and shaitan is the enemy of mankind, as the Quran warns us. Anyway, till next time, inshallah.